You're listening to the Fed and Fearless podcast. On today's episode, I'm chatting with Jennifer Brand about why kids get skin rashes and how you as their parent can help them overcome them. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm your host, Laura Schoenfeld, a registered dietitian, nutrition business coach, and online entrepreneur with over 10 years of experience in online business. And I'm here to show you everything I've learned about creating a life and a business that nourishes you. On this podcast, we'll talk about the lifestyle habits, practical strategies, mindset shifts, and leaps of faith required to build a healthy body, a powerful mind, a strong spirit, and a successful business. Hey there, welcome back to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm Laura Schoenfeld, your host as always, and today we have a really cool episode about a topic that we have not covered on the show yet, and that is skin rashes specifically in children. And if anyone out there listening is a parent or has a friend that has a kid with a skin rash, this is going to be a really important episode for you to listen to. There was things that our guests talked about that I had never heard of, and I will certainly be paying attention to this when I have my baby. I'll maybe even uh, check in with her to get a little help to make sure I'm not doing anything that could possibly mess my baby's skin health or gut health up. But I learned a lot, and I know you're going to as well. So our guest today is Jennifer Brand. Jennifer has a master's degree in public health, a master's degree in nutrition. She's a certified nutrition specialist, and she's actually actually a member of our Nutrition Business Accelerator program, which is how we met. She's an integrative and clinical nutritionist and the CEO of Jennifer Karen Brand Nutrition, LLC. Jennifer helps children with dry, flaky, weepy, red, itchy, painful rashes navigate the journey to healthy skin and enjoy a childhood free from disruptive skin symptoms. Instead of managing symptoms with more diet restrictions, environmental changes, and prescription creams, Jennifer uses functional testing and a detailed health history to uncover unique imbalances at the heart of the problem, and she provides a roadmap to restore balance so that your child can eat more foods, feel good in their skin, in, regain normalcy, and really just be a child. Conventional means fell flat and didn't adequately address Jennifer's own struggle with gut problems, allergies, and disordered eating, which was exacerbated by elimination diets, nor did it help her father's battle with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, her brother's diagnosis of psoriasis, and her mother's diagnosis of vitiligo. Feeling frustrated, these experiences inspired Jennifer to search for a different approach. Jennifer is a relentless detective putting her strong knowledge of nutritional biochemistry to work for you to identify what's driving symptoms and health problems in your child in order to address the root cause of them. Jennifer is also a faculty member of Learn Skin, and her work has been featured in peer-reviewed scientific journals, Voyagella, as well as on podcasts, online summits, and in-person presentations at venues such as Casa Colina Hospital in California. Jennifer has so much to share with us on the show today. I could probably have gone twice as long because I was learning on this conversation about kids and rashes and the things that can cause them. And so I know that you're going to learn a lot. And like I said, if you know somebody who's got a kid with a rash, especially things like eczema, psoriasis, that kind of thing, then you're definitely going to want to send them this episode. So I really enjoyed the conversation. I know you will too. And without further ado, here is Jennifer Brand. All right, everybody. Well, I am so excited to have with us on the show today, Jennifer Brand. Welcome to the Fed and Fearless podcast, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. And I would just love to start our conversation today with your story. I always feel like it's really important for my audience to get to know our listeners if they don't know them already and to just learn a little bit about what brought you to where you are today and the work that you do. So I know that we talked a little bit before we pressed record and you said that you didn't start out as a practitioner. You actually were a patient and had your own health issues that you had to overcome and that you've also seen loved ones struggling with skin issues in particular. So can you tell us a little bit more about your story? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think many of us in functional medicine have struggled with our own health problems and we weren't able to find relief with conventional means alone. I'm no exception. My main issues had been IBS, so irritable bowel syndrome, which started in my 20s. And I went through the typical rep- recommendations of, you know, a low FODMAP diet, elimination diets. Doctors tried to prescribe me antidepressants. I even had a colonoscopy. And through all of this, the symptoms continued. And as my diet restrictions continued, I developed disordered eating habits, fear of food, and eventually anorexia. And I still had IBS and it became debilitating for me. What was a turning point was that I started to explore what my body was trying to tell me. And symptoms are tied to systems and all systems in the body are connected. And so when I began to investigate that why, that's when things started to change. And, you know, I realized that diet restrictions were not going to solve my problem. And in fact, they were making it worse. So in order to get resolution to what I was going through, I did have to expand my diet, nourish my body, and deal with some of the emotional aspects of what had happened in my past when I was growing up that really were root causes of the problem. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about spreading the word that food is not the enemy and not the root cause of the problem. And also a number of my family members um, struggle with skin issues. My father was diagnosed with psoriasis as a child. And by the time he was 30, he developed psoriatic arthritis and he's in his seventies now. And I've just watched his health continue to deteriorate because the root cause of the problem hasn't been addressed. My mom has vitiligo and eczema. My brother also has psoriasis. My family members continue to take mostly a conventional approach. And, you know, this is where you can lead a horse to water, but you can't really make them drink, you know? And I think that I have experienced the benefits of integrative medicine, you know, combining the best of both worlds. Conventional medicine is necessary. It's life-saving. But when we weave in those environmental factors, lifestyle issues, and really start to look at the root cause of the problem, that's where we can really have an impact. Mm -hmm. That's got to be so tough when you have all of this knowledge to share with people who you care about and either they're not receptive to it or for whatever reason. And I I do think the conventional medical world, depending on who they're working with, may either just leave it out entirely or actually actively discourage it, which is really a shame because, you know, there's so many things we can do complementary wise. Like you said, you don't have to throw conventional medicine out necessarily, but that's got to be tough to be like, I have all of this stuff I could help you with. And if you would just let me help you, you'd feel so much better. Has that been your experience? It has been. And, you know, over the years that I've been in this field, I think the light bulbs are starting to go on. You know, I'll say, here, take this probiotic or try this vitamin. You know, so I'm starting to get little changes to happen. But, you know, change is difficult for everyone, you know, changes is, is, it's hard. So baby steps can be really helpful. Yeah, definitely. And I know that you specifically work with children in your business and I would love to hear what caused you to focus in on children as opposed to just the general population. Well, when my health issues began, I was very young. And so I felt scared, lost, um, uncertain, and the disordered eating habits that I developed started pretty young. And that's when these habits can have the greatest and unfortunately worst impact is in these young children. And so combining my experience with the elimination diets developed into eating disorder and my family's history with skin issues, and then seeing so many young children on restrictive elimination diets because of their skin issues, it just really struck a chord with me. And it turned out to just be something that I love to do. I love working with these little children and their families. And my ultimate goal would be to help children, you know, when they're young enough that by the time, you know, a few years out, 
They don't even remember that they had skin issues. They have, you know, really broad diets that are inclusive of everything. They can eat a cookie. They can have some cake, you know, when they go to the birthday parties. I want children to be children and have full, rich lives and enjoy childhood. I love that. And I can really hear the passion when you're talking about it for that bigger mission of helping kids enjoy their childhood. Because I can only imagine you know, most of us, I think if we haven't dealt with a health issue as a child, we would take for granted not thinking about that. Like I didn't really think about diet until I was in high school. And that was because my body had changed through, you know, like, I guess not, not totally puberty, but kind of those couple of years after puberty, when you start to get into like your 16, 17, 18. And that's when I started becoming unhealthfully interested in nutrition because I was trying to control my body. But I feel like that's a totally different circumstance than a young child who doesn't even have control over the situation. And maybe the parents are unfortunately misled or just don't know what they're doing or, you know, there's so much information on the internet. It's like, and we always know parents are doing their best, right? So this is not meant to make anyone feel bad about what they're currently doing, what they've done, but it is something where the kid at a really young age, doesn't have a lot of control over what their food choices are, that kind of thing. And so I can't even imagine growing up as a kid being stressed about, I can't eat this, I can't eat that. And, you know, have especially having those, you know, the skin issues that can be so painful and just like having to deal with that as a kid, I, you know, it, it sounds like it would be so difficult, not only for the child, but also their parents. So that's, I love that you are so passionate for helping kids get back to healthy skin. And, you know, and just to add to that too, so many of the parents that I talk to, and one of the main reasons why people reach out to me is because I do not promote elimination diets because most of the parents that I talk to are terrified that they're restricting their child's diet so much because they know, you know, whether they know from a biochemical perspective or just intuitively, children need fuel. Food is fuel. Those nutrients do everything. They build every structure in the body. They nourish the body. And kids are like little athletes. They're growing and developing. And, you know, pound for pound, they need more nourishment than adults. And, you know, here, one of the primary recommendations when we have skin issues, when children are struggling with something like eczema, is to take foods out of the diet. And this is coming from health professionals. Mm -hmm. And I would think that with food and restriction and all of that, like that probably creates some pretty substantial emotional challenges or relational challenges. Like if you're the parent that has to be the bad guy preventing your kid from eating the foods that they want to eat, I can only imagine the kind of emotional charge that that might create. And no parent wants to have that kind of relationship with their kid where they feel like they're just like telling them no about all of the stuff that you know, in theory, other kids are allowed to do and everyone's fine with it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I've seen, and, and it gets more challenging as kids get older and, you know, we're talking about teenagers and then we get into the, well, you know, why are the test results still so off? What's happening here? You know, the kids are sneaking food now and hiding food and, you know, it, it just becomes extremely disordered in so many ways. And it's really unnecessary because food isn't the root cause of the problem. Yeah. Well, that's so important for people to understand. So if you guys get nothing else from this conversation today, I hope that you'll remember that from Jennifer. So let's talk about if food isn't the problem, what is the problem? And I know that you you like to focus on addressing the foundation and going back to the basics. So can you explain what that means and how does the foundation apply to skin rashes like eczema, that kind of thing, especially when it comes to children? So the foundational aspects that I have found in my practice that really impact the outcomes that we get to improve what's happening on the skin are, you know, number one, food is not the root cause of the problem and making sure that the body has the fuel it needs to do everything else it's supposed to do, including building and repairing healthy skin. And, you know, number two is really what's happening in the gut. So this is where up to 80% of our immune system is located. And it's important for a number of reasons. So 
you know, if we have problems in the gut, we can't digest and absorb nutrients from the foods we do eat. So even if somebody's eating everything that they need to be eating for building and repairing healthy skin and full nourishment, it's not going to matter much if you can't digest and absorb it. And also 80% of the immune system, that's a lot of the immune system. So if there are problems in the gut, it can significantly impact how the body is going to react to potentially triggering substances, whether that's food or environmental triggers. And also detoxification is always a hot topic. But in order for detoxification to function the way it's supposed to, you have to have good gut health because it's a major route for excreting toxins. And then if you try to assist or um, address detox without making sure that the gut's working first, you can end up with an even greater toxic burden, toxic burden since those toxins can't get out and symptoms can get worse. And, you know, this is also, I, I want to mention gut problems are a root cause of skin rashes. They're also a root cause of why we are sensitive to foods, food allergies and food sensitivities. And so, you know, this is again, why really the primary things I look at when somebody comes into my practice is like, okay, what are you eating? You know, and are you getting in enough foods? Not what we can take out, rather what we can add in. And then also what's happening in your gut? Um, and I want to talk about the gut a little bit more because it really is important. Uh, and there is a clear association between what's happening in the gut and skin conditions. And this is the gut-skin access. And so when we're talking about problems in the gut, these are things like imbalanced gut flora and problems with digestion and absorption. There may be increased gut permeability, which we know is leaky gut. So there are billions of microorganisms in there, and this is our gut flora. And when they are out of balance, we can get inflammation and irritation in the gut, which leads to that hyperpermeability or leaky gut. And when this happens, toxins can get out of the gut, out of the gastrointestinal tract and into the bloodstream. Once they're in the bloodstream, they create an environment of systemic inflammation. So that means inflammation throughout the body. And then this can trigger, trigger all sorts of reactions, including those skin rashes. So these toxins can actually come from die-off of those microorganisms in there, which is actually natural. This happens all the time. And it happens even more during digestion. So, And this is also how our food allergies and food sensitivities can develop because those food proteins can also get out of the gastrointestinal tract and get into the bloodstream. The immune system begins to identify them as foreign and this can cause reactions. So, you know, when we're talking about those food sensitivities, it's not just food that might be causing the problem. It could be these endotoxins, these toxins from the microorganisms in there. So we really, another reason why we really just can't blame food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine if your anything that you eat is feeding bacteria that could be releasing these toxins, like you can't just remove all food, right? I mean, there's going to be something that they're eating, whether it's, you know, a piece of cake or a sweet potato, right? So it's like, I think just knowing that food sensitivities often have nothing to do with the foods themselves can really help people understand why food removal isn't effective. Because I do think having worked with different providers and, you know, I do, and this is not meant to, um, you know, trash talk anybody, but I think it was really common, probably a good, like five to 10 years ago where, you know, doing food sensitivity tests and looking at like, you know, antigen reactions in the blood, that kind of thing, that that was a super common approach to helping with a variety of health conditions. And the response to those test results was, okay, pull all these foods out. And maybe, you know, if that's really what's triggering the issue is those particular food proteins, you might see some benefit in the short term with symptom relief. But as you're explaining, even if you get a benefit from pulling those foods out, it's probably not actually addressing why you are reacting to those foods in the first place. And I feel like I do think sometimes people tend to forget that our bodies want to be healthy and want to function normally. Like our we're designed to actually have good health and everything in our body is designed to keep us alive and keep us healthy. So if you think about like, why would your body decide to just start attacking all of these food proteins for no reason, it really doesn't make any sense. And so I can see why understanding 
okay, even if it is a food protein issue, why did the food protein get into your blood in the first place? That's going to be much more helpful for long-term relief than just being like, well, that food protein is what your body's reacting to. So let's let's just take it out, right? Yeah. And then over time, you know, what I see is that once you take foods out that seem to be triggering, you might get symptom relief for a period of time, but because that gut hyperpermeability and those issues are still present, you're going to end up with more food sensitivities to other foods over time. The diet continues to get smaller and smaller and it's really a vicious cycle. You know, I do, because I, I, I get asked this often, you know, people come to me with these food sensitivity tests and, you know, if something generally, you know, if something is like a low sensitivity, I don't even bother having people take it out. If it's a highly reactive food, then maybe, but you know, sometimes these highly reactive foods that are noted on these tests, this child has never even eaten them, you know? So, so the test results um, are interesting to say the least. And, and then of course too, you know, if there's a food that you can identify, that you can really identify as triggering, then yes, it makes sense to keep it out of the diet while we're doing this work to resolve the underlying root cause imbalances. But if you're not sure, it's probably not the food. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would even think that even if in the short term it is helpful to take it out, that doesn't mean it's like you can never have this food again for the rest of your life. It's not like it's a, you know, a, a typical actual allergy where, I mean, I know allergies can go away over time, especially in kids, but it is something where, you know, if it's like a sensitivity reaction and you do heal the gut, there's a lot of foods that can likely come back even if you did have to, have to take them out for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Those IgG reactions in particular, the food sensitivities, most people can eat those again, you know, once we do that work in the gut. IgE, which are the allergic reactions that, you know, can end up in anaphylaxis, those are a bit different and those I always mm-hmm. do recommend that people work with their allergist on. There's some really good data nowadays of being able to desensitize to some allergens like peanut and dairy, always work with your allergist on that. That's not something to do on your own, just FYI. But there are a lot of options now for people with food, actual food allergies versus the food sensitivities. Mm -hmm. Now, I would love to hear from you. Like, I think when we talk about gut health, a lot of times on this show, especially we're talking about adults. And I think a lot of people could understand how adults would end up with poor gut health between stress and, you know, poor eating and like alcohol and medication use and that kind of thing. I think most people can really wrap their brains around how an adult would have skin issues. I think what tends to probably be a little more confusing to people is how do kids end up, especially really young? Like I'm sure you've seen babies with these skin issues and gut issues and stuff. And so I'm sure a lot of people out there might be thinking, well, how does a baby or a toddler end up with a messed up gut? So any thoughts about what could be contributing to like microbiome or, or other gut issues in such a young child? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, right? I mean, in general, allergic conditions have been on the rise for decades. And, you know, again, this goes back to we're talking about allergic conditions like eczema, like food allergies, even asthma. But back to that 80% of up to 80% of the immune system, which is located in the gut and involves the gut microbiome. So, from the childhood perspective, I mean, the immune system is in constant communication with the gut and with the skin and environmental factors that change the composition of these microbes can disrupt that crosstalk. And then we can end up with allergic conditions. And this is particularly problematic in early in life, you know, when the immune system is developing. And the three most common problematic environmental factors that contribute to this really are antibiotic use. You know, so maybe mom had to take antibiotics while she was pregnant or during labor, maybe while she was breastfeeding. C-section births, we get inoculated with our microbiome when we come out through the vaginal canal. And then also diet plays, it does play a really big role. High fat diets, and diets low in fiber also contribute to what's happening in the gut, therefore what's happening with our microbiomes in the gut and on the skin. And, you know, we can't always avoid antibiotics and, you know, they're life-saving 
we need them. We can't change how we were born. You know, if you're born C-section, you are. And sometimes, you know, that's absolutely necessary. And, you know, we can focus on what we can do, which is support the gut microbiome now, you know, once somebody is born. And, you know, from a dietary perspective, you know, fiber, dietary fiber, carbohydrates are actually really important for good gut health because they feed our good gut bugs like a prebiotic. And our good gut bugs make metabolites. Um, They make short chain fatty acids. And these things are super important for lowering inflammation, um, having good gut health, strong immune system. And so, you know, we end up with, you know, these diets that just don't foster good gut health, don't include these healthy carbohydrates. Um, You know, and these are things like, like our complex carbs. So, quinoa, you know, whole grains, um, vegetables, starchy and non-starchy vegetables. So we definitely want to make sure that those are included, you know, and, and also we can eat prebiotic foods along with the probiotic foods. So sauerkraut, other fermented veggies, and kids can even take a probiotic supplement and, and so can parents. But yeah, so I mean, in general, it, it really is some of these environmental factors that are playing a role nowadays in as to why kids are at alarming and increasing rates experiencing these allergic type conditions. Mm-hmm. And what do you think about some of the like more external environmental things? Like I know a more common topic of conversation that I've seen, and of course this is not my area of expertise, but I've, you know, I have friends with kids and there's been some of them who have had these issues before. And a lot of them are looking at things like detergents and soaps and that kind of stuff that they're using. Is that something that you feel like is an important part of the healing process to adjust those products? Good question. It can be, yes, definitely. And natural isn't always better, by the way. But yeah, free and clear laundry detergents can be helpful. You know, number one, I think that is is very helpful. I'm somebody who periodically goes to something that smells nice just because I like my clothes to smell nice. And I forget that I end up with hives <laughs> when I start using those after a while. So yes. So free and clear laundry detergents. If you can avoid like fabric soft those types of things, clean household products, you know, keeping everything as clean and, you know, without some of those harsh chemicals as possible can be really helpful. You know, at the same time, a lot of these, you know, more natural products do contain things like lavender, which is actually a common allergen. Like lavender seems to be in a lot of natural products that we put on our skin that we clean with. And in Europe, it's actually considered a an allergen, like a, a toxic allergen. So natural isn't necessarily better. Um, but yeah, keeping things, I think, with the fewest ingredients as possible is really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I found it really interesting when I'm shopping for products and I'm not always like, I try to generally get some of the the more high quality things and go for companies that I know are paying attention to that kind of stuff. But even if I'm just running in to get like some laundry detergent or some hand lotion or something, it's interesting how hard it is to find stuff that isn't scented. Right. And I feel like the scent stuff tends to be some of the most um, problematic when it comes to any sort of allergic or skin type of reaction. And it's just really interesting because it's like, you would think that having the scent wouldn't be necessary, but, and especially with like laundry, I mean, to be fair, they sell, they sell like those scent type things to add to your laundry. It's like, oh, the laundry detergent didn't smell strong enough. Here's some extra, uh, extra things to put in there to make the scent last for like months. So you're just like bathing in these chemicals. And I just, it's, I hope that that changes. Cause unfortunately I feel like most people, the average person in this country doesn't even know that that might be a problem for their health, let, let alone their skin health. And it it is kind of just disturbing, like how many chemicals that people are be, like exposed to on their body and their hair, like their skin products, like stuff that they're just like literally sitting in all day 
just to like smell a certain way, which, you know, again, I think you could probably get away with not having scented products for everything that you own. Oh, and you know, also along with talking about the scents, um, scented candles can be a problem. Diffusing, you know, the the essential oils can be a problem. Um, so we'll- oh, so, so the, I might have you talk a little bit more about that because I think most people are probably like, oh yeah, Febreze and like those air effects things. Like, of course that's a problem. But what about essential oils is interesting because I know there's a lot of parents that use essential oils with their kids. There are, and I I don't want to bash essential oils because I know that they can be helpful for some people, but I want to raise caution with them because they are harsh. They should never be put straight on the skin if you're going to use them topically, I would work with, you know, somebody that knows botanicals that is an expert in that. But yes, they can be dangerous. I mean, they, they can be really dangerous. They can burn the skin. They can exacerbate rashes. And, you know, certainly when we're diffusing them, that becomes an environmental allergen. We're breathing this in not only are we breathing it in, but the the vapor, I mean, can settle on your skin, on your clothes, everything. So yeah, I definitely, I, I do recommend not to diffuse them if your child has allergies and or rashes or, you know, use them topically again, unless you're working with somebody that knows how to do that appropriately, because it can be really problematic with scented candles as well. You know, and I noticed it was interesting. This was years ago. I, I did have a diffuser. And my dog at the time, every time I used it, she would kind of like just start rubbing herself against the walls. Like she would kind of go a little nutty. So yeah. So actually, and they're not good for pets either, by the way. So (laughs) be careful with those essential oils as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I know the companies I've bought mine from will tell you if something's like safe for children and everything. And there's not a lot of them that are listed as being safe for children. So if you think about what most people would probably be doing if they're just used to using them, they're probably not even aware that it's something that they should look into, especially if they have like a new baby or something. It's like, maybe you shouldn't be diffusing the same stuff you were diffusing when you didn't have a baby. So it's, it. I do think it's really interesting where it's that kind of greenwashing thing where it's like natural is safe and effective and beneficial. And, you know, it's not always the case. And that thing you said about lavender, like most people probably wouldn't be thinking about that. And it's important to be aware of because, and again, we're not saying don't ever look at any of this stuff and like it's all trash or something, but it is something where I think people forget that a lot of plants, like they're toxic to humans. And that's maybe part of what their toxin is, is smelling nice. And that like, you know, it's, it's an actual like thing that your body doesn't want in it or around it or, you know, inhaling it or something. And so it's, um, and I, I know kids also have different types of sensitivities to those things compared to adults. So I do think it's really important for parents, if you're going to keep using essential oils, at least check that they're safe for kids and pets if you have pets around. Cause I don't think, you know, I, I'm probably prone to this as well, where it's like, this smells really nice. I'm going to diffuse this. And my poor animals are probably like, ah, what's going on? <laughs> yes, <laughs> so. exactly. Exactly. You know, that leads me to another comment I want to make about, you know, using things topically, because I, this is a really interesting one to me because I'm a science geek. But anyway, but along with the essential oils and things that can be irritating, using food-based products on the skin is also something we don't want to do. Um, olive oil, you know, sunflower seed oil. And these are recommendations I, I used to make until I saw some research. So when we have a broken skin barrier, eczema broken skin barrier comes before allergies. So what happens is when we have that broken skin barrier is that we can become sensitized to things through the skin so that when we then ingest them, we can actually have clinical allergy, which is like an allergic reaction. Um, The skin immune function is not as robust as gut immune function. So this is why food introduction recommendations have changed for babies. You know, why now we want to introduce all the common allergens when baby starts eating solids around six months of age and why we want to be careful not to put these types of things on the skin, especially when there's a broken skin barrier. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. And I'm guessing coconut oil would uh, be part of that too, which I know is super popular for being used as a topical skin moisturizer. It is. Coconut oil is such an interesting one too, because 
generally I recommend against it. Number one, it's food based. And, you know, number two, it's extremely antimicrobial. So it can actually really wreck the skin microbiome, which is already dysfunctional when we have eczema. However, Some people, like acne, for example, coconut oil can be helpful because it's antimicrobial, so it's killing off some of that bacteria. And some people with eczema do find it helpful. Some folks with eczema have higher colonization of staph bacteria on the skin. So if it's helpful for somebody, they might be somebody that has more staph. So everybody's different, basically, which I think people are gathering, right, by listening to this. So um, there there are no one-off recommendations. Everybody's individualized. So, you know, whoever's listening to this, like if something is working and is helping for you, this isn't saying to stop doing that because everybody is different. Yeah, definitely. So in your opinion, what would be one of the biggest mistakes that people are making when trying to heal their their child's skin rashes? I think it would really be like, you know, focusing on those one-off things, like focusing on the diet or just on the environment or, you know, just what you put on the skin and not looking inside and addressing root cause imbalances. And, you know, which I really find in my practice, especially with kids, is what's happening in the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, there's, and I'm just thinking about there's so many things that could affect that, unfortunately. It's not to scare people, obviously, but just thinking about even, I'm guessing, like micronutrient deficiencies, even during pregnancy that could be the baby's already being born with some nutrient deficiencies. And I know, I know our bodies as women do whatever it can to like shunt nutrients. So we're usually the ones that would suffer if there's a nutrient deficiency compared to the baby. But I'm sure even like subtle nutrient deficiencies and some of the more common ones that I don't even think like the conventional medical field really looks at, things like zinc and vitamin A, that kind of stuff that we know is super important for skin. Um, And even like vitamin A is like, don't take it while you're pregnant, so you better avoid it. And it's like, you know, doesn't matter that that's important for your immune system, your skin health, like, you know, reproductive organs, like all of the different parts of your body that actually need that, like to replicate and to create new cells. Um, but I would imagine there's a lot of babies, unfortunately, being born with even like mild nutrient deficiencies. And then when you add on a nutrient deficient mother, either possibly not the most nutritious breast milk, or um, if they're on formula and maybe there's some nutrients that are you know, in breast milk that aren't making it into the formula because we don't even understand necessarily what's in breast milk. I just think there's a lot of opportunities for kids, unfortunately, to be at a little bit of a disadvantage from their from a health perspective. And I do think we tend to, I, I think we have a little bit of hubris in the scientific world where it's like we assume we know everything about the way that it works and the way that, you know, oh, we can make this formula. It's a perfect replacement for breast milk. And, oh, these are the nutrients of concern in pregnancy and there's nothing else that you need to be thinking of. And I just, I sadly think it is actually really common um, for babies to be born with nutrient deficiencies. Um, And then I used to work a lot with women that were struggling to get pregnant. And this is something my mom also is like, this is her area of expertise as well. And we were actually just talking about today how um, when women are struggling to get pregnant, it's like they don't even talk about nutrition and and micronutrients and all of that in the in most fertility clinics. So you think about all these women who are getting pregnant because of um like medical intervention that po- probably needed some significant nutrient restoration to actually get pregnant if they were to get pregnant naturally and then it's you know questionable like is the baby being born at a disadvantage because the mother wasn't getting what she needed to actually have fertility the way that um she could have if she had been guided appropriately. So that's a whole nother ball of wax. And I'm sure that could be its own podcast episode. But I I just wonder, you know, when people question, like, how does a kid end up with this type of health problem? It's like, well, let's look at how women are being treated before getting pregnant, during pregnancy, after pregnancy. It's not like there's a ton of focus on women's health and like actual health, not just let's make sure your baby doesn't have like a neural tube defect or something like that. Actually, I'm really glad you brought that up because, you know, something that I do see are 
with a lot of my clients, you know, mom had health issues, you know, before she was pregnant, while she was pregnant, she had gut issues. She had, you know, overgrowth of certain things in there. She's been on restricted diets. You're absolutely right. And, you know, some of, there is some research showing that, you know, specifically, you know, while mom is pregnant, you know, and while nursing can help um, reduce the risk of allergies and eczema in baby, omega-3 um, fatty acids are also really important for that. Um, but yeah, you know, and, and when mom, so then like if mom is nursing and baby has eczema, then both of them are on restricted, you know, baby's breastfed, but mom is now on a restricted diet. She's nutrient deficient. She's losing weight. Yeah, exactly. And what do you think the quality of the milk is going to be? And, you know, and again, we go back to food isn't the root cause of the problem. Um, But yeah, what's happening with mom is really important as well in terms of what happens with baby and the subsequent development of or potential development of allergic conditions. Yeah. And of course, none of this, as I will repeat, is ever meant to make anyone feel bad about themselves or feel like, oh, I shouldn't be breastfeeding my baby if I'm not in perfect health or something like that. I think it's more just acknowledging the unfortunate reality that in most cases, unless you're working with someone who talks about this stuff and is really looking at it at a deep level, most women don't know as much as maybe they would need to know about nutrient status and about, you know, how to get that from their food or what what would be supplements to take if they're not eating certain foods. And I think it's like, I'm sure more common than not that women are just not educated about this stuff. And I just think it's really sad that a lot of doctors either aren't educated so they wouldn't be able to share it at all, or, you know, maybe they're partially educated so they're focusing on certain like hot topic nutrients, but they're not looking at the full picture. And then, you know, we're, we're in an environment in this country that makes it really hard to actually be well-nourished. Like it's, it's kind of fighting an uphill battle for most people. So it's not like, you know, you have to make a ton of terrible decisions to end up with nutrient deficiencies. You could literally just be eating a quote unquote healthy American diet and still end up with that. So that's why we talk about this stuff, right? Cause I think it's something that I know our, our listeners tend to be more savvy about this stuff, but maybe they haven't heard some of these things and maybe they have friends and family that haven't heard about this stuff. So the more we can get this message out there, the better. So the last thing I would love to ask is what would three things be that our listeners could do right now to help their kids start rebuilding healthier skin? So I would say eat, 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 expand the diet. Don't restrict the diet. So you've got to nourish the body. Number one, number two would absolutely be check out gut health. You know, if you and your child are eating a diet of whole real foods, which, and you're right, Laura, in this country, that can mean any number of things. But if you're on a, you know, already healthy diet and there are still problems, check out what's happening in the gut. That's again, where up to 80% of the immune system is located. We need to find out what's happening in there to help reduce the risk of what's happening on the skin, what's happening with the immune system and these allergic conditions. And, you know, number three, we didn't really talk about chronic stress, but um, that is something that I do take a look at. And, you know, when we think about stress, you know, we think, oh my gosh, I'm stressed out, you know, work, finances, whatever. So yes, that is an aspect of stress that kids don't necessarily have. They can feel yours as an adult, but stress can also come in the form of um, chemical things. So environmental triggers, and we talked about you know, some of those like essential oils or fragrances or things like that. And stress can be physical too. So just, you know, having rashes or having a health condition, restricted diets, those are forms of stress. So it's really taking a look at those three things. So, you know, diet, gut, and resolving or sort of mitigating any sort of any of those external factors that might be playing a role and really just taking a look, you know, at what goes in, you know, what goes on and what's around. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's a really great way to kind of conceptualize it in a really simple way. Well, Jennifer, it's been so awesome chatting with you about this. I'm sure we could have gone on for at least another hour with all of the knowledge that you have to share. If our listeners want to learn more from you, what can they do to continue their education and learn how they can really help their kids' skin? 
Yeah. So my website, of course, is a good place to find me. Uh, it's Jennifer Karen Brand altogether.com. Karen is spelled funny, but if you type it in the regular way, you'll get to me too. But it's C A R Y N. And then you can also find me on Instagram. Also, my handle there is Jennifer Karen Brand. That's spelled with the C A R Y N. And then also, I think we're going to probably put in the show notes, I have a, a freebie that might be helpful. So it's called the probiotic mistake you're making that's flaring your child's rashes because not all probiotics are created equal and the wrong one really can exacerbate the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like that's probably a really common issue where you know parents are trying to help their kid and they read an article about probiotics being good and they go out and get something that sounds like a good product and they don't realize that it's actually making the issue worse. So I'm sure that'll be a super valuable thing for parents to check out. Well, we'll make sure there's all of those links in the show notes, Jennifer's guide to the probiotics, her website, her Facebook and her Instagram. So if you guys want to go check that out, um, it's episode 117 on our website and we'll make sure that you guys can connect with her. And if you want to send her a message on social media, let her know what you thought of the episode, if there was any big aha moments that you had. I know I had a few myself, so I really appreciate you coming on to the show and bringing your expertise. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun being here and I I hope this is helpful for a lot of people. Absolutely. And thanks to those of you for hanging out with us for the last hour. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week on the Fed and Fearless podcast. Take care, everybody. Are you a dietitian or nutritionist business owner that wants to create an online business that consistently brings in dream clients who actually want to buy your services, but you're struggling to figure out the right business strategy to get there? Then keep listening because I have a special opportunity that will help you create the highly profitable and impactful nutrition business that you always wanted. Inside my signature group coaching program, the Nutrition Business Accelerator, created exclusively for nutrition and dietitian entrepreneurs, you'll learn how to start, grow, and scale your online business to six figures and beyond so you can experience the financial and time freedom that you desire. I created this program to help struggling nutrition entrepreneurs get clarity on who they serve, how they serve them, and how they can stand out in a crowded market so that they can more easily attract dream high paying clients into their online nutrition business. This program is for brand new business owners and nutrition students, as well as those who have been in business for months or maybe even years, but aren't getting the traction that they'd like to see in their growth. Inside the NBA, you'll learn the most important foundational business building and marketing principles not just the latest tools like social media. So that way you can experience sustainable business growth that adapts to the constantly changing world of online business. Over the course of 12 weeks, I'll show you how to attract high paying clients who are excited to work with you and willing to pay you the rates that you deserve. You'll get training on how to effectively sell your services in a way that feels authentic and converts prospects into paying clients without feeling pushy or salesy. And you'll get step-by-step instructions on how to create programs and services that provide truly transformative results, leading to glowing testimonials and referrals from your current clients, so you can have the greater impact that you desire in the world around you. You'll also learn how to manage your time, your energy, and your resources so you can get more done in less time and experience the freedom that you really got into entrepreneurship for. When you apply what you learn in the NBA program, you'll never have to feel stuck or overwhelmed in your business again. Want to make this your reality? Then the Nutrition Business Accelerator is your pathway to achieve all of this and more. Get the proven strategy that has helped hundreds of business owners start, grow, and scale their nutrition businesses to five to $10,000 months and beyond, and accelerate your progress to build the nutrition business of your dreams. Go to lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash NBA to learn more about the program and get your name on the wait list so that you can be the first to know when our doors are open for our next round. That's lauraschoenfeld.com slash NBA, which is short for Nutrition Business Accelerator. 
If you have big dreams of running your own profitable and joy-filled nutrition business, you do not wanna miss out on this one-of-a-kind business coaching opportunity. I can't wait to support you inside the NBA program.